applied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. I'd like to read this for a moment from some of the other translations. Seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us by his glory and virtue. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who hath called us to his own glory and excellence. Seeing that his divine power has given us all things that are needful for life and godliness, through our knowledge of him, our knowledge of him, who has appealed to us by his own glorious perfections. Now I want to focus for a moment on, on these spiritual words, words which the Holy Spirit teaches. Divine power. You know, power is particularly associated with God. Remember in the Psalms, it's, it is written, uh, God has spoken once and twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. And then you recall in Solomon's prayer of old, and it was echoed again in our Lord's prayer, he said, Thine is the kingdom and the power. Belongs unto God. And then you remember that ascription made in the Revelation. It said, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Power belongeth unto God. Divine power. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's given them to us. Given them to us. It's vouchsafed them to us. It's bestowed them upon us. It's granted them to us. It's endowed them upon us. Now, these are all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything that's requisite for life and godliness. All things that are needful for life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. All things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness. Everything that has to do with life and godliness. Everything that serves to the end of the purpose of life and godliness. Everything that's required for the possession and realization of life and godliness. And divine power has given that to us. Amen. Life and godliness. You know, uh, most of the uh, translators, they, they found it hard to improve upon that expression. Life and godliness. That, those are good spiritual words. Life and godliness. Amen. Through the knowledge of him. Now, as we've uh, be developed our, through our theme uh, thus far, we're speaking of the, this intimate knowledge of God. Now, the, uh, the translators here, they have, they have tried to express this in their uh, in their uh, in their uh, renderings here, for example, the full personal knowledge of God. See, that's they're trying to get this cross. It's not just knowledge about God; it's knowledge, intimate knowledge of God, as what we're talking about. Or another one says the true knowledge of God, or our knowledge of God. Several of them said that our knowledge of God, personal. See, our knowledge. Now, I could tell you that the word in the original here is epignosis, but that, uh, that wouldn't mean a whole lot to a lot of folk. Uh, so I, I'll just uh, 
I won't uh, develop that any further, but that's, uh, I think we could come to that conclusion just by comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. Amen. You know what, Job, he said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. See, that's this knowledge of God, where this is somewhat, we're entering into this knowledge of God. It's not far off anymore. This knowledge falls into a play, the affection, the desire, and the in involvement with the object that is known. Now he's called us, some of the translators he says, they, they render it, he's called us to glory and virtue, and others say he's called us by glory and virtue, and, and actually there's a, if you want to stoop this low, there are, there are Greek manuscripts to support both views, so, but actually both things are involved, and I, that's what I want to demonstrate here. Actually both of these things are involved, and we'll de develop this as we go along. He's calling us to glory and excellence, I like that expression. God is calling us to the glorified state where men shall be in full possession of moral excellence. Amen. The lament of Romans 7 and the bondage of corruption shall be remembered no more. Amen. We shall no more say the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit lusteth against the flesh for these are contrary one to the other. We will not say that anymore because God is calling us to moral excellence. Amen. Now he's calling us by his glory and excellence. Calling his excellence. See, this is involved too. The glorious excellencies of his person have a great attraction to faith. Amen. As men are thus drawn by this vision, they are changed into his image from glory to glory. If two, if, I mean, if you prefer the word two, that's all right. But he's still calling us by his glory and virtue. But if, and if you prefer the word by, well, we can allow that. But see, he's calling us by his glory and virtue. He's calling us to. See what I think? Both of these things are involved. He's calling us by his glory and virtue to the glory that's up again. Both of these things are involved. I myself prefer the word excellence to virtue of. Uh, but you understand the, the, the word, uh, what, what the word means in virtue, but virtue in this common usage in English uh, has to do with uh, uh, a goodness that is maintained where there is power to go wrong. See, like a virtuous woman. See, now, now God is, see the domain that God is calling us to, that uh, in the full realization of that, that won't be involved anymore. There will be no more power to go wrong. Amen. He's calling us to moral excellence. Divine power. I want to draw your attention to its unique manifestation in the New Covenant era. And I, I want to contrast this with the Old Covenant dispensation. I want to contrast this with angels who were greater in power and might. I want to contrast this with the creation, with his eternal power in Godhead, the flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea crossing. See, all of these were manifestations of the power of God. But I, I just draw your attention to this, and all of these ones that I've enumerated thus far, that no one was ever saved unto eternal life by this kind of power. Amen. The power that was manifested at the Red Sea, did not save anybody unto eternal life. The power that brought the floodwaters did not save on, on anyone unto eternal salvation. See, that's, we're talking about a different manifestation of God's power now. Divine power in the present age. This power is not forcibly exerted upon men. Rather, it is a salvational resource made accessible and tapped on through the knowledge of God. It is an abundantly resourceful wellspring made available to men through the redemption in Christ Jesus and appropriated by faith. Amen. Now there's a text here that I want to draw your attention to in Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. This 
this is an amazing passage of scripture. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, and Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Even the Pharisees and the, and the doctors of the law. Marvelous thought. Now you know in the New Covenant era, we, this same thing is continued in principle. See, now the, the power of the Lord is present to save men. Just like it was present back there to heal men, now the power is present to save men. Sin is now put away. Jesus is now at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit has been sent down from heaven, and thus the power of God is present to save men. Now the natural creation. Let's talk about this, this other type of power. I want to develop this so we can see the contrast. You know, this isn't really thought about much in the church world today. When people think about the power of God, they don't normally associate it with salvation. And in this sense that we're talking about here. I mean eternal salvation. Amen. The worlds were framed, the scripture says, by the word of God. But in the new creation, in the new creation, creating, framing, and building has given way to constraining, to divine appeal, and to the glorious heavenly calling. See, these are the manifestations of divine power. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, by that, he didn't mean that he was going as a builder. He was not going as the carpenter. I hear there's songs that carry this thought that he's been working on this place for 2,000 years. Now, that isn't the sense in which Jesus went to prepare a place for us. See, it was by his very presence, the man Christ Jesus, the second man, the last Adam, and the second man is now at the right hand of God, one of us. Our elder brother, see, he went to prepare a place for us. His very going prepared the place. Amen. And the place was prepared when he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. One of our sisters is not able to be with us today, so I want to give honor to her and give a quote. Uh, something she said some years back. This is Sister Becky McCormick. God did not speak man into existence, but formed him from the dust of the earth. You know about all the rest of the creation, it says that he spake and it was done. And in the Genesis uh, account we read, and it was so. And it was so. And it was so. But it was not so with man. See, when God came to this final, this final step of creation, it was not on that wise. See, man could not be framed. It was, he was not like the rest. He was unique. He was a unique part of this creation. God did not speak, and it was so. No, he formed him. He gave this very special personal attention to man. He formed him from the dust of the earth. Now, even in the natural creation, man could not be framed into existence because he is made in the image of God. Now, in like manner, in redemption, man is not coerced into divine benefit, but rather is constrained and compelled with heavenly incentive. Amen. We have the exceeding great and precious promises, and we have the warnings in the Scripture. See, now, these two things are working together. Now, they, there has been an analogy made that these are like two locomotives. See, on our, on our way to heaven, the life's railway to heaven, we've got, a, we've got a locomotive that's in front of us. These are the exceeding great and precious promises. They're, they're drawing us into heaven. And we've got a locomotive that's behind us. These are the warnings. He said, see that you fall, not by the, by the wayside. For there were some that did not enter into God's rest, you know. So we have both of these things in operation. See, but God is working by constraint. And he's not forcing that. See, he's constraining that. The, the power of God is now in this, 
in a, in a different manifestation. Now, please don't lose my train of thought here. We're, uh, we're developing this thought of divine power in at least two different senses. Divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and governance. Now, con let's contrast the salvational power in the old and new dispensations. Now, in the old dispensation, power was of the nature of preservation and rescue from enemies in the realm of the seen. Uh, these were de deliverance too that were soon forgotten. Just think of Noah and the floodwaters. Now, he got drunk very short. Now, I'm not saying this to reproach our, our father Noah. God forbid. But I'm just saying that the deliverance was soon forgotten. It was, and it wasn't See, it was because of the nature of the deliverance. It was a temporal deliverance. And Lot took him by the hand and brought him out of the, the cities that were that God was burning up. And the Passover, the Red Sea, the Gideon and the Midianites, and so forth and so on. We could continue on uh, ad infinitum. In each of these cases, there was a distinct manifestation of divine power. The power was visible, very apparent, it was mighty, and it was invisible. But the power was in the realm of the seen. The fountains of the great deep were broken up in the flood. Angels appeared to deliver Lot from destruction. The plagues of Egypt demonstrated the mighty power of God over the elements of nature and even over a, a rebel king. Great bodies of water were parted. What ailed thee, O thou sea, and thou Jordan, and thou wast driven back? The mighty power of God. And I think in the Psalm 136, this is a catalog of the of manifestations of the power of God. It says, for I just excerpt a couple things here. To him that made great lights, the sun to rule the day, for his mercy endureth forever, and the moon to rule the night, for his mercy endureth forever. And then we'll skip down, he, and he who slew great kings, for his mercy endureth forever, and he slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever, and we, we could continue on all down through that chapter, but time would forbid. Now let's talk about the new covenant display of divine power. It's not on the same order at all. In the New Covenant, power is of the nature of deliverance from oppositions in the unseen realm. Amen. For the most part. Amen. We, won't, we don't want to limit God. I'm not limiting God. I'm saying, not saying He doesn't work at all in the, in the seen realm. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about there has been a definite shift of, God, of emphasis we're not talking about exceptions now. There are exceptions, but I'm talking about a general shift in the in the emphasis in God's working now. Amen. Amen. Satan, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. We have the rulers of the darkness of this world, evil principalities and powers. We have the sin, our own sins and the sinful flesh to contend with. But you must be enlightened to perceive these things. I mean, you, you will not, if you go out here on the street, you will not see Satan walking about as a roaring lion. You won't find him out here on the streets of Montgomery with eyes that are not perceptive. See, he's just, he's not in the realm of the scene. All this stuff, all of this power is now, it's, it's, it's being demonstrated in the realm of the unseen. Where faith is the substance. Now we find men being delivered at conversion to Christ from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. Now we see men pressing into the kingdom of God with violent determination. The kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. We find redeemed men and women are redempt, relentlessly engaged in casting down imaginations and high thoughts that have been spawned by the evil one. And these are...
plots in particular that obscure and befloud the great redemption in Christ. Now, if you can receive it, I just pose this uh, challenge to you. Those that are in Christ have become stewards of the divine power. Amen. Amen. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That gospel is yours to preach. And that gospel is the power of God. That's the, it's, and it's the preeminent display of the power of God in the New Covenant era. And I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's the preeminent one. Amen. Amen. Think of this. There we read in the Revelation about angels that had power over waters and angels that had power over fire. But in the New Covenant era, we find men that have power with God. Amen. Now, I want to talk about the singular nature of the deliverance and salvation in the present age. Deliverance and salvation is now of a singular nature, and by that I mean he hath delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, that's just as true as when you believed. That was true on the day of Pentecost. That's true today. That same deliverance, it was one great deliverance. You see, and it's carried through all down through the centuries. One great deliverance. Amen. It was not so with the children of Israel. They had many great deliverances, and they were soon forgotten. But see, we're, we're riding on the crest of the great deliverance yeah. brought out on, on Mount Calvary. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Amen. One great deliverance. One for all the people of God for all time. Now there's a sense in which this deliverance is complete and a sense in which it's yet in the process of dem uh, demonstration. We would not want to re be remiss in mentioning that. Now the now, some folk uh, would have trouble with this, but if you can receive it, the day of Pentecost was a mightier deliverance than the Red Sea crossing. Now, with some, some folk, that would be uh, something hard for them to grapple with, but nevertheless, that is the case. Amen. See, on the day of Pentecost, we have eternal ramifications that are all of a sudden, they're set in motion, see? This, the Red Sea crossing was over, and when it was over, it was over. They had to have uh, various uh, ordinances uh, established in Israel to remember it. But when it was over, it was over. And what transpired in the Philippian jail cell was greater than that which transpired in the lion's den. If you're able to see it. Amen. Now, it's just as true today as it was on the day of Pentecost. By faith, we are riding on this crest of deliverance. I already mentioned that. The significance of this deliverance remains ever new to those who are walking by faith. This is the commentary on the nature of divine power in the new covenant era. Now, let's contrast for a minute again with the old. Remember, don't lose our thought here. Divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and godly. So we have to understand the nature of the divine power. Prior to the new covenant economy, deliverances were and had to be repetitive. They were temporary in nature, and their greatness soon faded as a leaf. We do not have to be delivered again and again from the wrath of God. Israel did. Those that are believing on the Son of God are delivered and remain delivered. Now I ask you, now God, it's, it's the nature of God, see, it's his, his manner of working is progressive in nature. In other words, he doesn't do something in one age and then do some, 
something that's of a lesser magnitude in the next. See, God, is, his, his, his nature is to be progressively increasing in manifestation as he uh, proceeds in his eternal purpose, at least as it appears to us, as it's manifested to us. Has God left off doing mighty deliverances? No. They're just in another realm now. They're just in another realm. Divine power does not impart life and godliness directly and forcibly upon men, but rather it makes available the things pertaining to life and godliness for men to lay hold of by faith. Divine power brings salvational benefits within our grasp. And without this power, faith could not grasp them. We would just be whistling in the dark. We would just, it would just be like some of uh, this theological hogwash about blind faith, this sort of thing. So faith isn't blind, brother. It's the Amen. substance. Amen. It's the substance of things hoped for. And faith is the substance of things hoped for because divine power has brought the substance near. Amen. It had to, we're in a moral, this is a moral arena that we're in. See, we're in the, there's the power of darkness, see, that's opposing your appropriation of these things. And see, divine power has brought the substance and the evidence within your reach, see. So it's, Amen. Amen. that's why it's substance. It's the same with the evidence or conviction of things not seen. If divine power did not bring the benefits near to us, faith would not be evidence and it would not be substance. Now let's uh, talk for a moment about faith's inter interrelation with divine power. See, now there's a, this strain of theology, it's some call it Calvinism or determinism, whatever you want to call it, but, but see, uh, see, divine power in this sense that we're talking about today does not impose upon men. Amen. Amen. See, it, see, God is working in concert with man's will. See, he cannot, God cannot violate man's will in salvation. Now, in the, in the end, if men, don't, if men don't receive this eternal benefit that God is proffering them, well, God will certainly, his power will certainly uh, come upon them against their will. But we're talking, see, God is calling them to salvation. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See the interplay here between faith and divine power. There is interplay. Divine power cannot benefit unbelieving men, and by the same token, there would be nothing for faith to elect effectually lay hold of if divine power did not bring them near. We are kept by the power of God, through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Now, I just want to talk about this keeping power for a moment. Now, I realize I don't want to limit God what he's able to do, but I'm just saying that there are some people that they, uh, like, for example, some were beheaded. Now, did divine power keep them or not? That's the question I want to ask. Now, some people, they think of keeping power only in the sense of God preventing you from having an accident or something like that. No. See, that's not the primary sense in which this is talking about here. See, divine power was keeping the ones there that were cataloged in Hebrews chapter 11. It was still keeping them. It was preserving them unto eternal life. Amen. See that? It was, even though they had, lost, they had lost their lives for the gospel's sake, divine power was still operative there. Divine power in its relation to life and godliness. And now its distinctive manifestation in the present time. The power of God in the new covenant era. The gospel, we've already mentioned, is the power of God unto salvation. The preaching of the cross, Paul said, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Amen. The preaching of the cross. Amen. And here, in the, we also have in, the, in Paul's uh, letter to the uh, Corinthians here that he talks about Christ, the power of God, Christ, the wisdom of God. Now I realize that by him, God made the worlds. There was this other manifestation.
manifestation of divine power. And I know that by him that all things consist. But in this sense, Christ, the power of God, see, we're talking about this appeal that's made to men to come back to God. That's the sense in which he's talking about there. Jesus, remember, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's the Christ, the power of God. It is only the power of God to those that are saved, however, demonstrating that this power is not doled out indiscriminately or arbitrarily, but is only operative where there is faith or receptivity on the part of men. See, that's, that's the distinction of divine power in the present age. This is power that makes appeal to the heart, that persuades man that heaven is worth making whatever sacrifice that's necessary to get there. This is power that was manifested, the kind of power that was manifested prior to the New Covenant era was not able to do this. Life and godliness. Let's talk about this for a moment. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And I want to emphasize the essentiality of both. Life and godliness. The provision for life and godliness has to do with man's recovery from personal sin and the consequences of the Edenic transgression. The tree of life could have imparted life to Adam and his offspring, but not godliness. The tree of life could have granted life to our first parents even after they had sinned. Come now, now that's what God said. He said, He said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now let's cast him out of the garden before he, he partakes of the tree of life and lives forever in this state. There was a tree of life in the garden, but there was not a tree of godliness. Life has to do with responsiveness to God, godliness with a proper, well-pleasing response. Let's contrast godliness with legalism just for a moment. Now, this is, I guess this is a word that's haggled about a lot, but let's, I'll try to explain what I mean here. Life is the antidote to alienation from the divine presence. Godliness, but not legalism, not legalism, is the remedy for incurring the divine pleasure, displeasure. Let me say that again. Life is the antidote to alienation from the divine presence. Godliness is the remedy for incurring the divine displeasure, but not legalism. Legalism is a form of godliness, but it is not godliness. I'm talking about... Uh, trying to uh, make it on your own, just by observing a set of rules, that sort of thing. Any, I don't care whether it's even the law of Moses or rules that men have imposed if you're trying to earn your way to heaven by this basis, well, that's not godliness. It simply is not. Now we rejoice in the law of God after the inward man. His law is written on our hearts. But see, this legalism is talking about a situation where that has not happened, and so men try to substitute something else. Legalism evidences the presence of ungodliness that must be harnessed by external restraint. Now, life and godliness require a basis to be effectual. The foundation for both life and godliness are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By his death, sins are remitted and men are justified. By his death and burial, our old man was crucified with him. Sin was condemned in the flesh and the entire fleshly order was given the death sentence. He was, Jesus was the last Adam. Or we could say, if you'll excuse me, he was the last of that. Amen. The last Adam. He was the last of the natural order. Amen. The fleshly order. Jesus was the last one and and when he died and was put in the tomb, that was the end of the, of, that was the last Adam. Amen. By his resurrection, saints have been
become enthroned with Christ and have been made to sit with him in heavenly places. Amen. Amen. Now let's contrast the other tree that was in the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan tried to convince Adam and Eve that this tree was a tree of godliness. And he was successful. He said, if you'll just partake of this tree, you'll be as gods. Oh, isn't that godliness? That you're as gods? No. He says, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. No, that's not godliness. It's not godliness. What good is the, of the knowledge of good and evil if it does not enable you to abhor the evil and love the good? Amen. Amen. See, that's the state that Adam and Eve were in. They were set helplessly afloat in this state of... They, they knew the difference, but they didn't have any... Their heart's affectation was not involved there. There is no provision in the New Covenant to occasionally and perfunctorily partake of safety or of life and godliness. Amen. Jesus is calling men who will with determination and constancy put their hands on the plow of divine involvement. Amen. All shall have a resurrection body, but not all shall be holy and righteous still. Amen. Amen. Godliness cannot be had by divine fiat or simply because God wills it to be so. Amen. Otherwise, all would be saved. Amen. He said he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, right? Amen. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, see? Now, if God could will everyone to be saved, he would. Amen. Amen. But see, that's man is created in the image of God. Life and godliness, but to all eternal securities, we say, there is no tree of godliness. Amen. Amen. So you just can't perfunctorily partake of the tree in your saves. It doesn't work that way. Life and godliness, profitable to men. To be in possession of life and godliness is to have ultimate safely, safety. It makes one the apple of God's eye. And this, I want to talk for a minute again about this non-perfunctory nature of the reception of life and godliness. By faith in Christ, we beholding as in a glass are changed into his image. And we, and as we behold by faith, the blessed provisions for life and godliness are brought within our spiritual grace. For Adam and Eve merely to eat fruit from a tree could not bring about this change. Life and godliness cannot be had by perfunctoriness and punctiliousness, touch not, taste not, handle not, which things are to be perished with the using, but rather by the constant engaging vision of God which only faith brings. Amen. That's how life and godliness are obtained. So you can see if somebody's not serious about the things of God there, See, they can't have life and godliness. These things just don't go together. God is calling us. He's calling us to glory and virtue. Now, this could only happen in the New Covenant era. In the two former dispensations, even the best of men shrank back from a manifestation of God's glory. This is a marvelous thing. Just think about Moses in the cleft of the rock. Now, he, God had to hide him. So he could reveal just the hinder parts. And to hide him in the cleft of the rock. But see, now it's, it's an enrapturing thought. As we think about the glory of God and, and how faith lays hold of this. It's a, it's a marvelous thing. We're changed from glory to glory. See now, see now, this has been brought to this is this evidence is the, the working of the redemption that has been made in our behalf. See, this this is the evidence that. Sin has been put away. In Christ we have been made meet for the participation in his glory. It is now a source of great and blessed attraction. Wherever faith is, there is a foretaste of glory. And in the divine economy, wherever there is a foretaste, it is but a prelude to the full participation of a gift. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Call it, he called us to glory and virtue, and he called us by glory and virtue. Both are involved. We said this already. But God is calling us to glory and virtue or ex 
excellence, but he calls us by his glory by giving us foretastes or miniature samplings of the glory and excellence that is up ahead. These foretastes are had, of course, by faith. God is calling us to glory. Compare this with the present vile body or the body of this humiliation. See, it? We'll, we'll say goodbye at last to this body of humiliation. It's a source of great humiliation uh, to those that are walking by faith. Farewell. Farewell, body. God is calling us to glory and moral excellence. Contrast this with Romans 7. Contrast this with the flesh lusting against the spirit and the fifth spirit lusting against the flesh. In that world, no man will say, I am sick. Amen. Amen. In more than one sense, too. <laughs> Amen. I'm talking about in the spiritual sense. Amen. When you realize, blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of, of God. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now he's calling us to the knowledge of him. We must qualify what we mean by knowledge. To say that mere knowledge of itself is the sole elixir for man's reconciliation to God is a form of Gnosticism, mm -hmm. and in order, which is an inordinate exaltation of knowledge. This is knowledge, the one we're speaking about, the knowledge that we're speaking about in 2 Peter here, is knowledge that has the redemption in Christ as its foundation and cornerstone. Crucifixion and resurrection are the sweet-smelling savor of this knowledge. And this is the knowledge of a happy God, happy because of the removal of sin and the cause of man's alienation from himself. This is the knowledge from which all things that, that pertain to life and godliness are, are granted us. The fact is that before sin was put away, the little that was known of God brought home to man's conscience the knowledge of sin. I think about, you know, that Paul uh, talked about the, the form and the knowledge of the truth that was in the law. And then, uh, by the laws of knowledge of sin. The fact is that prior to the removal of the sins of the world, knowledge and truth were only available to men in divinely shaped containers. That was the law. The form of the knowledge of the truth. The law was an introduction to the knowledge of God. But it was not the knowledge of God itself. The tabernacle, the service of God, the Ten Commandments, all pointed to the knowledge of God that would be freely accessible in the New Covenant era. The point of man, we'll hasten on here before, before redemption was made. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, and because God desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, men desperately needed it, God earnestly desired to give it, but redemption had not yet been accomplished in Hosea's day. What a lament. But we must be quick to add that Israel was remiss in, in taking hold of, of what was available to them. Amen. We don't want to reproach God here. How little a portion of him is heard, uh, Job said. This is a commentary on the availability of the knowledge of God in his day. Godly men were acutely aware of the sparsity of the knowledge of God in Job's day, and yet they did so much with what they had. You think of the book of Job, and this is a, a theological masterpiece, but, but it was gleaned from very sparse revelations of God. And look at the great flood of revelation that we have in our day, and what are we doing with it? Yeah, amen. Amen. The knowledge referred to on our text, this is the knowledge of God, not the knowledge of, about God as we spoke of before. This is the knowledge of interplay between spirits. It was 
in this regard that the, the Apostle Paul said that some have not the knowledge of God. There in 1 Corinthians 15. Elsewhere it was called the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now this knowledge about God is the knowledge of bystanders. It's the knowledge of mere onlookers. It's the knowledge of the uninvolved and casual acquaintance. We have drink, eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. See, that's the knowledge about God. And in the diction of Paul, we all have knowledge in this sense. But not all have this knowledge in the other sense. And this is knowledge particularly that puppeted up, as he said. However, even with the knowledge of God, you recall what the Apostle Paul, the abundance of revelations uh, that were associated therewith, Paul was given a thorn. So don't be surprised if God gives you one too. See, as you come into the knowledge of God, he may give you a thorn too, so that you don't boast too much about the uh, this exaltation. It is a, a marvelous exaltation to come into the knowledge of God. All things pertaining to life and godliness. The matter of all things. We're speaking here of the transition from justification to glorification. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. Now we're in a condition of justification by faith that that is not decreed. Sins are forgiven, we're justified from all things. But we're not justified from lukewarmness. We're not justified from double-mindedness, unless it's repetitive. See what I'm saying there? There is, I'm just showing that there is this matter of casualness just does not blend in with the, the, this matter of the knowledge of God. So you can't be casual and be a, a possessor of the knowledge of God. The justification assumes that the individual that has counted the cost of discipleship with Christ has sold all that he has to buy the field where the heavenly treasure is buried. The all things of our text assumes that the, the same thing. Obviously, the pursuit of life and godliness is synonymous with giving the most, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Uh, unmistakably, someone who is trying to make the best of both worlds is not in a quest for life and godliness. Amen. Amen. I'm going to wrap this up real quick, I promise, if you'll just bear with me. Now, the all things that are essential, these are things that are essential, the all things of our text. All, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, the all things of this text in 2 Peter are things that are essential for, for the transition from justification to glorification. They're essential. Now, put another way, these are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. These are some of the, the, uh, the all things of our text. I want to elaborate on the use of, in Scripture of the, the expression all things. Sometimes they're used in different senses. The all things of our text in 2 Peter 1.3 pertains to the domain of essentialities for the transition from earth to heaven. See, you need all of them. All things pertaining to life and covenant. You can't get by with some of them. You need all of them. Amen. Amen. They are not optional. They are not just for some. But they're for all. Now, if it, the all thing, this matter of all things, is just another place. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, also in chapter 6, it says, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. Now, the all things of 1 Corinthians 10, 23 is that of imposed selectivities. Selection of things harmonious with the afore, aforementioned essentialities is imposed upon the individual. They're not the same. For example, the matter of meats. All things are lawful. So we don't have trouble with this too much. It's a matter of whether you can eat meat or not, that sort of thing. But back in Paul's day, this was a, a matter of conscience. See, this was a big matter with Paul and the, and the brethren back then. Whether you're going to eat meat or not, or whether you're going to observe the Sabbath day or not. 
or whether you're going to regard the day or not. See, this was a matter of conscience. See, had to do with your conscience. Or Jesus brought up this matter of uh, of marriage, and Paul did too there in First Corinthians seven about. Uh, See, it was, this was an option that was imposed upon men. There was the option of being a unit. So these are selections of things harmonious with the divine, essential, with these aforementioned essentialities. The selection of these things is imposed upon the individual. In other words, you have to select some of them. You've got to decide whether you're going to eat meat or not. You're going to have to decide whether you're going to observe the day or not. You're going to have to decide whether you're going to get married or not. See this? Or whether you're going to be a unit and serve God as a unit all the days of your life. See, these are things that are imposed upon you. You have to select. It, circumstance will require you to make the selection. And then there's one other aspect of this. He, he doesn't say not all things are legal. He says all things are lawful. There's a difference. Lawful speaks of that which is harmonious with the law's intent. All things lawful assumes deliverance from law in its condemnatory ministry. The writing of law upon the heart, the basic propensity in though of those in the New Covenant era to do what is pleasing to God. All things are lawful to me from that perspective. Obviously, murder is not lawful. But for those in Christ, this would be a foreign thought anyhow. Amen. Amen. See, that's not even in our in the domain that we're in. And then one other aspect of all things. 1 Corinthians 3.21. All things are yours. Life, death, things present, things to come, Paul, Cephas, Apollos, and so forth. The all things of 1 Corinthians 3.21 speaks of the domain of sublime potentialities to be appropriated and possessed by the people of God. All things are yours. And how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? These things are complementary to the essentialities mentioned above in our text in 2 Peter. They're complementary. There's no contradiction between these things. They, they just dovetail perfectly in with these things. To sum up, the all things of 1, 2 Peter 1, 3, you need all of them. They come together as a package, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Salvation, justification, atonement, propitiation, they come together as a package. The all things of 1 Corinthians 3, of 10, 23, you don't need all of them, but they... But circumstance will impose upon you to choose some of them. So choose them to the glory of God. Now the all things of 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23, you are urged in Scripture to possess as much of them as you possibly can to the glory of God. Life, death, things present, things to come, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, be possessors of them as Joshua and Caleb possessed Canaan, and be trustworthy stewards of them as Eliezer with Abraham's goods. Amen. Amen. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Mm -hmm. Now all of the things above, and I'll conclude with these thoughts here, are speaking of a high perspective. None of these things are offensive to God and none are disharmonious with his word. That's the perspective of all things. So in conclusion, let's understand the nature of divine power that has been made available to us and make abundant use of it. And with much wisdom, let us possess the things that pertain to life and godliness as we lay hold of eternal life and increase in the knowledge of God. According as his divine power have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us 